Rayla has returned. We should be enthusiastic about that, but we should also be a little concerned about what she has seen and how she has reacted to what she's seen. After leaving Callum in the graphic novel Through the Moon on his 15th birthday, she has returned two years later. She has a new appearance and a little companion. She has returned with a great supply of knowledge, it seems, and yet she does not have the absolute answers that she sought. We should be thinking about who Rayla has become. She seems like she has been humbled to a certain degree. She's certainly a far cry from the rather defensive and a bit combative teenager who constantly made quips about humans being so aggressive and materialistic compared to the sanctity of the elves. Now, of course, to a certain degree, that air she adopted of self-conscious superiority was always one part a ruse, a desperate attempt to disguise her uncertainty and her questions about who she is and what she really wants out of herself. Her identity was sent into flux as she could not fulfill the role she had adopted as her image, as who she is. She couldn't be the perfect elven assassin. She couldn't fully commit herself to the militant role that she had adopted in order to find a sense of purpose and empowerment in her life after what had happened with her parents. As Blood Moon Huntress lucidly demonstrates, their disappearance had made her feel rather empty inside. Not just because they'd left her, but because their leaving without her made her feel incapable. They made her feel that she couldn't be with them because she didn't have the capacity to defend the elves and to serve that cause. So she looked for a way that she could regain that sense of having control over her own life and her own circumstances. And she found that in Renan and Athari, and she found that in being an assassin. Renan trained and encouraged her, and she was his dutiful pupil until she couldn't be anymore. Until she realized that she couldn't perform the duties of an assassin. That she could not subsume her passions and desires and her own individual perspectives within the limits and constraints of this rather insular and reductive role that she had to fill as an assassin defending the elves against those wily and overly selfish humans. She tries to justify herself by the standards of her society, and this leads to her adopting a image of herself that is fundamentally false, that does not fit the full scope of her passions and yearnings. This creates a gap between who she is and who she tells herself she wants to be. That is a large part of why Rayla's character is so consistently compelling. Yet, Rayla is now at a loss. She has sacrificed all the growth that she made during her relationship with Calum and through the warmth and compassion of that relationship in order to pursue Viren, to serve what she believes to be her duty. And she has failed. She has not found Viren. She has not killed him. We know this even before watching this season because Viren is brought back to life two years after his initial death by Claudia. 
about at the same time Rayla is accepting the reality of her own inability to bring herself the sense of catharsis and finality that she sought. Rayla has changed from her experiences. She has possibly found a lot of information about Viren. She certainly looks like she's located some d degree of information, and yet her journeys have not brought her the clarity she really wanted. Experience has served her, but not to the extent that she had envisioned. I think about one of my favorite essays, that being Ralph Waldo Emerson's writing on experience, in which he critiques and analyzes the viewpoint of experience being this clarifying, edifying wellspring that allows us to test our preconceptions against the light of practical reality demonstrated most overtly and comprehensively in the writings of Michel de Montaigne. According to this Montaignean view of experience, we have to learn from experience. There is no other way because our a priori preconceived conceptions about the world as lofty and rationalist as they might be, innately are not sufficient to fit the amorphous, fire-like character of the world, which is in a constant state of change and flux, and has a constant sense of unpredictability and uncertainty about it. Emerson accepts a lot of what Montaigne says, but he critiques the idea that experience can give you that kind of certainty, even on the plane of practical, mundane, intimate, everyday life. He says the character of experience is innately fleeting, innately amorphous. Experience does not offer us lessons or morals. It does not allow us to draw clear conclusions. It does change us, but not in an obvious or necessarily beneficial way. Rayla's encounters with the unknown and the uncertain during her two years of looking for Viren all alone, not having the relationship with Calum to fall back upon and ameliorate her worst tendencies, has changed her. But the extent of that change is neither straightforward nor linear nor altogether clear. She might not learn the lessons that we want or expect her to learn. Now, I don't want to be too bleak. The Dragon Prince, despite its moments of moral uncertainty and epistemological haziness, is ultimately a show that reconfirms the ability for human connection and understanding to triumph over the uprooted, chaotic fragmentation of a war-torn sectarian society. In fact, it holds that that level of connection, that level of willingness to open oneself up to others, is the best resource we have against the beshadowed darkness of a world defined by constant conflict and degradation of a state of things in which all progress, all aspirations of positive change are suspect. The Dragon Prince is not Game of Thrones. It is not even the Legend of Korra. It is ultimately a show that its deep love of human optimism and idealism is evident, although it does evince a belief that that optimism needs to be restrained and directed in a positive and productive direction so it doesn't become pure Pollyanna-ish deception. Rayla seems older and sadder, to use Coleridge's words, but she still 
seems to deeply care about Callum, and the Dragon Prince is this show with a unyielding belief that a relationship between two people who are committed to making that bond work and are willing to try and understand each other can work, it can succeed, despite the challenges that might prove as obstacles. I believe Rayla and Callum's relationship will eventually be repaired. It will just take a lot of time. So thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Donate to my Patreon if you can and you want to see more videos like this. Keep watching Season 4 of The Dragon Prince when it comes out. Keep watching the first three seasons right now. You might notice I am not in my usual location. I am in Albany, New York. A strange and fascinating, vibrant city that's this interesting mix of the traditional and historic with your stately old brownstones and the new and brutalist. I recommend visiting if you have the chance. Anyway, tune in soon for my next analysis. We'll be coming soon, promise you that. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.